I'm back up by the creek on this beautiful January afternoon to take a look at another lens that I often keep in my camera bag. The Rokinon HD8M 8mm fisheye lens with auto aperture chip and removable hood. Note that Rokinon is a Samyang brand, and I've seen comparable products marked under both the Samyang and Bauer brand names. This consumer grade lens can be yours for about 220 US dollars as of January 2019. I'll be using it on a Nikon D5100, which is the camera body I've been using for the past six years. Oh, and for best image quality, please watch this video in 1080p. While I pan around a bit, let's talk about what a fisheye lens is. Unlike a more typical lens, a fisheye lens gives you an ultra-wide viewing angle, in this case 180 degrees from corner to corner, while also extremely distorting the image. Rather than seeing the distortion as a negative aspect, it's typically used for artistic effect. While the image will show more of the space you're in, it tends to make it feel larger than reality. So while you might not want to use it for real estate photography, it still has many other uses. This particular lens has a fixed focal length of 8mm in an APS-C or DX format, and fills the entire sensor with the image. It's also functional in a full-frame camera, but in that case it'll give you an image with rounded sides. Here I am putting it on my Nikon N65 film camera and looking through the viewfinder. We can see that while it does fill to the top and bottom of the frame, the left and right sides are rounded. The first fisheye lens was developed in 1905 by the physicist Robert W. Wood, and it was given its name because it depicted what a fish's view of the world above the water would look like. This optical phenomenon is known as Snell's window. It's pretty neat. Look it up on Wikipedia to learn more about it. Anyways, this is the first known fisheye image recorded. My son says it looks like a snowflake melting. It's actually a group of men standing around the water-filled pail that made up this primitive camera. Fast forward about 100 years, and we have greatly improved optical equipment. But enough history, let's look at the specific lens. There are only two interactive components to it. The first is the aperture ring. You'll likely always put it in the smallest aperture setting so that your camera can set it automatically. I tend to have difficulty putting this lens onto my camera. The marking is difficult to spot immediately, and it's a little bit too tight, and I almost always end up changing the aperture in the process, then have to set it back to the proper setting. It's a little annoying, but also not a super big deal. The other interactive component is the focus ring, which has a nice rubber grip on it and is very easy to use. The markings, in both feet and meters, are useful if you can approximate how far your subject is. I had seen another review where it was stated that at the lowest f-stop, it was difficult to focus properly. Perhaps it's just because I do a lot with manual focus anyways, but I'm not experienced this myself. As long as I have enough time to judge what it is I'm shooting, I pretty much always end up with an in-focus image. If you're worried about this though, here's my tip. Put your camera into burst mode so that you can hold the shutter button and it will take many successive exposures. Slide the focus ring out to the lowest possible setting you could want. Then take a burst of images while slowly sliding the focus ring forward. One of these images should be in focus. Another feature of this particular lens is the detachable hood. I've not found this to be useful on an APS-C sensor camera, and it actually gets in the way. Sometimes the hood gets bumped without realizing it, then you end up with a black spot along the edges. But if you're shooting on a full-frame sensor, you'll likely want to have it off. This particular model has a focus confirm chip. While there's no autofocus motor, you can still use the camera's rangefinder. This will also help you get your image in focus. In truth, perhaps foolishly, I've never used this. I always trust my eyes. Now that I'm looking at it, though, I don't actually see that it works. Maybe my camera's just broken? As I understand it, this chip also relays lens, exposure, and metering data to the camera so that you can use the auto mode. And at the very least, your exit data will contain lens information, which is nice to have. The elephant in the room that we're neglecting is the front of the lens. Look at it compared to my kit lens. Yikes. The front element is so curved that the cap is more cylindrically shaped than disc shaped. And let's not forget to weigh it. With the lens cap on, it weighs 422 grams, or just shy of 15 ounces. It's comfortably carried around my neck, and also comfortably fits in my hands as I operate it. But none of this matters at all if the image quality doesn't pan out, so let's take a look at that. The four things that most people care about when looking at lenses are image sharpness, vignetting, chromatic aberration, and barrel distortion. I don't have a setup for objectively measuring these characteristics, so I'll instead be comparing against the Nikkor 18-55mm VR2 kit lens, and hopefully we can draw some conclusions from that. Also, because this is a fisheye lens, I'm not going to address barrel distortion. Sharpness. This image was taken with focus set to infinity. The center of the image looks reasonably sharp, but we do see significantly softening as we travel to the edges. 
Also, some lens flaring due to the sun being in our shot. Comparing to the kit lens, autofocus to the bottom center, it looks about similar in terms of sharpness, and similarly as we approach the edges we see the sharpness degrade, though it's certainly not anywhere near as drastic. Vignetting. I struggle to see this too well unless it's extreme to the point of cropping, like on the Sigma 18-300mm f3.5 contemporary lens, which I did review earlier, the link's down below. All I can really say is that it looks like there's a little bit of darkening in the corners, similarly to what I see on the kit lens. And finally, aberration or color fringing, where light is projected onto the sensor differently based on its wavelength. This is best seen in areas of high contrast. You can definitely see the telltale purple and green noise at the edges, but it goes away completely at the center. The kit lens exhibits aberration as well, but does a much better job compensating for it. At the $220 price point, it really doesn't get any cheaper than this. We're talking shoestring budget here. Be aware of the shortcomings in image quality and decide if it's right for you. For most hobbyist photographers, the quality is probably good enough, while if you make your living doing this, you'll surely want to opt for something higher end. Some things that would make this lens better? Obviously better optics. Autofocus would be nice. That's really the only thing that I can think of that's missing here. It's not a killer feature for me, but your preference may differ. At 8mm, optical stabilization isn't going to do much for you, so it's fine to go without. And just to recap the other parts that I didn't like so much, it's very tight attaching it to my camera, and I end up unintentionally turning the aperture ring. And the hood can come off if you're not paying attention, which can get in the way of your exposures. Both of these are easy to write off as user error, but if you're prone to clumsiness, it's certainly something to keep in mind. That's all that I've got. I hope this was informative and useful. If so, go ahead and hit that thumbs up button. Consider subscribing too, so that you can see more cool stuff like this. But I want to know what you think about this lens. Has your experience differed from mine? Did I overlook anything obvious? Let me and future viewers know by leaving your comments below. See you next time!